Hello, Mission Church. Thank you so much for joining us. We're excited today to continue our series through the book of Exodus. We've been talking about the God who is near. What a powerful statement about who God is in our lives. Last week, we left off the story of Moses in the wilderness. Uh, God appeared to him in a burning bush really calling him to raise up to be the Messiah that would lead the people of Israel out of slavery and captivity in the land of Egypt. Uh, they had been enslaved for 400 years, and I'm sure that many of the Israelites had forgotten God's promises to them, had forgotten that, that God really existed. I, I mean, they lived in this pagan culture in Egypt where they worshiped so many different gods, and there, there were so many um, challenges that they were going through that I can't imagine how difficult it must have been for them to hold on to their faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of their forefathers. And, and probably some of them forgot that, that God still cared about them. And maybe they wondered if he would ever set them free, wondered if he would ever come to their rescue. And, and so here comes Moses into the picture. God's appeared to him in the burning bush, kind of raised him up to be this deliverer, and now he's coming into, into Egypt and, and encouraging uh, the people to go with him and, and coming before Pharaoh and demanding that the people uh, of God be released. And I want to read for you from Exodus chapter 5, what happens when Moses stands before Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, and, and says, let my people go. It says in Exodus 5, 1 through 2, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. So now you have this battle that starts to brew between Pharaoh, who was like a god in his culture, and, and between God, the one true God. And, and not only did Egypt need to understand that, that their gods were not real and, and that Pharaoh was not a real god, but the people of Israel needed a reminder that their god, the god of their forefathers, had not forsaken them, was not finished with his plan for their lives. And, and so I want to talk before we jump into these 10 plagues that, that God brought against the land of Egypt. I want to talk about the purpose of why would God do that? Why did God use these 10 plagues? Now, the, the first purpose is really that God was going to bring judgment through the plagues against Egypt for their disobedience. God was commanding Egypt to let his people go free. And, and in that moment, Pharaoh, the, the leader of Egypt, was saying, I refuse to acknowledge your God. I refuse to obey your God. And so the plagues were an act of judgment against God for their disobedience. But also the plagues were used to show the, the people that God is the one true God, that, that there's no other God who is like our God. He was demonstrating that to the Egyptians. And we're going to see in each of the plagues that, that God is, is really attacking some of the gods of Egypt and demonstrating his power and superiority over them. And that God is showing to the Israelites that he alone is the one true God. So I want to talk about these uh, plagues a little bit. Each one of them follows kind of a similar pattern. Uh, Moses would come to Pharaoh, would demand, uh, God says, let my people go that, that we might worship. And, and Pharaoh would say, no, I'm not going to let the people go. And, and so Moses would say, well, then God's going to bring a plague upon you. And, and, and then the plague would happen just as Moses had said. And, and then Pharaoh would have a hard heart and, and he would refuse to relent and refuse to obey God. And, and so once again, this cycle would continue and 10 different times God showed his power and wonder before bringing his people out of the land of Egypt. So I want to start with the first of the 10 plagues, and that was the plague where God turned the Nile River into blood. Now, it was kind of fitting that God would attack the Nile River because the Nile River was the source of life in Egypt. Egypt is a desert, and as you know, in a desert, you can't have life without water. And the Egyptians depended on the, the Nile for water, for drinking, for farming. They depended on the fish in the Nile River for food. It was their main source of life. And, and in fact, they had multiple gods that were attributed to the Nile River that were part of their worship uh, in this way. It was um, the great god Kanum 
was considered the guardian of the Nile sources. Uh, the god Hopi was believed to be the spirit of the Nile. One of the greatest gods who was revered in Egypt was the god Osiris, the god of the underworld. And the, the Nile was considered to be the lifeblood of Osiris. So it's kind of almost funny and ironic that God would turn that river into blood. And so I want you to listen in Exodus chapter 7 as God brings about this plague on the people. It says in Exodus 7, 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that is turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the heaven, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn to blood. The fish in the Nile shall die. And the Lord, the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff, stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers and their canals and their ponds, and all the pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned to blood. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that all the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. And there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same thing by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart was remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. God brought about this amazing plague where he turned all the water of the Nile into blood, devastating their, their source of life, their source of food, all of the things that they needed. And, and yet Pharaoh's heart remained hardened. You're going to see after each of the plagues that the secret magicians of, of Egypt tried to replicate the, the miracles of, of Moses and, and the, the plagues that God was producing. For the first couple of plagues, they were able to do that. But later, we're going to see that, that their efforts were fruitless to stand against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, the second plague that God brought was the plague of frogs. Now the Egyptians worshiped a God who was characterized as a frog. And so frogs were sacred in their culture. In fact, it was punishable by death if you were to kill a frog. And yet God brought frogs out of the Nile River, frogs that came into all their bedrooms, all their, their houses, frogs that inhabited every place. And at the end of this plague, the frogs were dead and piled up everywhere and they made the whole land stink. The third of the plagues, was the plague of, of gnats. And these gnats came through and they would sting and they would bite. And this plague was a judgment as well against one of the gods of the Egyptians. It was the god Set, the god of the desert. And unlike some of the previous plagues, the magicians of Egypt were unable to duplicate the, the work of, of Moses and Aaron in producing these gnats. They were a big pestilence. The fourth one was the plague, the, the plague of flies. This was a judgment against the god of the flies that the Egyptians worshipped. And it's interesting in this plague because God clearly distinguished between his people and the people of the Egyptians. The place Goshen where the people of God lived, none of the flies attacked there, but they all attacked the Egyptians and the animals and the people where they lived. And it wasn't just the nuisance of having flies around, but they would bite and they were uh, annoying and harmful and painful flies. And yet God continued to uh, bring about more plagues because the hard heart of Pharaoh, he was unwilling to obey God. He was unwilling to let the people go. The fifth plague was the plague of livestock. 
And God told Moses to tell Pharaoh that he was going to strike all the livestock in the land and, and destroy them and kill them. This would be a huge blow to the economy of, of Egypt at the time. In those days, people didn't have wealth in banks. They had flocks and herds, flocks of, of cattle and, and lambs and goats and, and all kinds of livestock. And, and God said he was going to strike them down. And that's exactly what he did. This again was an attack against uh, one of the uh, one of the gods of Egypt, the god of the goddess Hathor and the god Apis, were both depicted as cattle, and so God is coming against them. And and in this case, Pharaoh even sent his investigators go down to the place where the Egypt or where the Israelites live and see if their cattle are dying too. And sure enough, he found that none of their cattle were dying, only the ones in Egypt. And yet he remained hard in his heart, and he would not repent. The plague number six was the plague of boils. And, and in this plague, there were, there were painful boils and sores that broke out on their skin. And, and this was a judgment against several of the gods uh, of, of Egypt, the gods uh, who were over things like health and, and disease and preventing the people from having sickness. And these were the gods uh, Sekhmet, Sinu, and Isis. These gods, uh, God is literally making fun of them by bringing these boils on the people. And, and in this case, this time, it says in, in the text that the, the secret magicians of Pharaoh were unable to even stand in the presence of Pharaoh because of the painful boils. And, and they said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, no man can do this. This is the finger of God, literally the judgment of God. And yet Pharaoh continued not to repent. He hardened his heart against God and would not let the people go. Now, I know this is a long list of plagues and a lot of things, but I want you to hang with me because there's a point to all of these plagues, and I want you to understand what God was doing and, and the purpose behind this. In fact, before God brings about the seventh, eighth, and ninth plagues, he issues a warning, a warning to Pharaoh. He says it's going to get worse. The plagues are going to grow in severity and they're going to be even more dangerous and more challenging. I want you to hear what he says in Exodus chapter 9, starting in verse 13. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and on your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the face of the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up, to show you my power, so that, the name, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Yet you are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go." God issued a warning in his mercy and grace to Pharaoh saying, you need to listen. You need to let my people go. And if you don't, the plagues are going to get worse. And God says to Pharaoh, I could have wiped you off the face of the planet, but I raised you up for this moment of judgment so that all the world would be able to see that I am the one true God. And yet Pharaoh continued to harden his heart. He would not release the people of God. And so God brought the seventh plague, the plague of hail, it was a hailstorm like they had never seen before in the land of Egypt. And in this hailstorm, there was also fire that came and it destroyed all of the crops, once again attacking the gods of, of Egypt, the gods who were over the crops and, and, and the harvest. And, and God was saying to them, there will be no harvest this year in Egypt because I'm destroying and wiping out all of the crops in your land and there will be no food for the people. And yet once again, the people of Israel, their crops were spared. There was no hail and no fire in the land where they were at. Now, the eighth plague was the plague of locusts. If there was any food left after the hail, if there was anything that had survived, then a swarm of locusts came through and they picked every plant clean in the whole land. They ate everything and devoured the land and, and destroyed all the vegetation in the land. So there was nothing for the livestock to eat, nothing for the people to eat, no crops that would survive in order to be harvested. This was a devastating blow against the people of Israel. And this was once again an attack focused on the gods of, of Israel that, or the gods of Egypt that they had worshiped, the gods Nut, Osiris, and Set.
These are the, the gods of the, the crops and the harvest. Finally, we come to the ninth plague, the plague of darkness. The plague of darkness was so severe because for three days, God literally blotted out the sun and the people were in complete darkness. If you read in Exodus, it says, in fact, that they were unable to even walk around or go anywhere or do anything because it was so dark that, that it was so oppressive. And yet somehow God in, in his sovereignty was able to make sure there was light in the land of Goshen where his people were residing. There was light for them. And God distinguished once again against his people, between his people and the Egyptians who the plagues were coming against. God brought about darkness as an attack against the land of Egypt, as a direct uh, attack against their god, Re, who was the god of the sun. This was one of the main gods that they worshipped. This was one of the gods who provided the sun that made things grow, who kept them warm. The, the god who brought about the harvest, who did all of these things. In fact, Pharaoh himself was considered to be a representation of the God of Re. And yet God directly brings this plague to say, you're Pharaoh and your gods are powerless against me. I can do whatever I want to do. God was literally using these plagues to break the backs of the Egyptians, to force their hand, to let the people of Israel go and to demonstrate to the world that he is the one true God. Now, next week, we're going to pick up and, and see the very last of the 10 plagues. But I want to close this message by sharing with you a, a couple of take-home thoughts, a couple of things of why do we read this and study this, and what application point does it have for us today? Why do these uh, plagues matter to us? Why do we study this? Why is it important to understand the history of the Israelites and, and how they were delivered from the land? Why is it important for us to read about these things? And I want to give you two reasons, two points of application that I think are so powerful for our lives today. The first one is this, God is mighty to save. God is mighty to save. God is able to do anything. In fact, in these plagues, we see a demonstration that God is literally willing to move heaven and earth to bring about the deliverance of his people. Now, I know that, that some of you who are watching this today, maybe you're going through something difficult. Maybe you haven't been in slavery for 400 years like the Israelites, but maybe you're going through a financial hardship right now. Maybe you're going through a, a relationship issue in your marriage or, or with a friend or a family member. Maybe there's a situation in your life that just seems impossible. Maybe the doctor has given you bad news and, and you're just up against something that seems like, man, if God doesn't intervene and if God doesn't do a miracle, if God doesn't bring something powerful about, then there's no hope for me. And I want you to know that the God that we love, the God that we serve is a God who is mighty to save. The God that we love and serve is a God who is able to do all things. In this story of the plagues, God literally demonstrates his sovereignty over nature, over uh, the, the animal kingdom, over the, the weather and the cosmic activities. God shows his power and sovereignty over every aspect of life. And God can move on your behalf too. God can work in your uh, life today to bring about whatever it is that you need in your life. And so I want to encourage you to trust in the God who is able, the God who is mighty to save. That, that our hope shouldn't be in, in the things of this world. Yes, we have doctors to help with our, our, finance, our, our, our health problems. Yes, we have financial advisors we can talk to about our money and, and we have counselors we can go to about our relationship problems, but we serve a God who is able to do big things, great things in our lives. And I want you to trust and follow the God who is mighty to save. The second thing that I want you to see from this is that God is the one true God. This story demonstrates to us that among all the gods of the world, among all the things that, that people in, in human history have worshiped, God rises to the top. He alone stands among all the other gods of this world. There is no other God who is like our God. There is no other God who is able to do the things that God does. Now, I know in our culture today, we don't worship things like the sun and the moon and the sand and things like the Egyptians did in their day and their culture. They had gods for just about everything and they worshiped all of those things. Now, in our culture today, we don't typically worship those things. We have other gods. 
in our culture today, we have gods like materialism and wealth. And we worship things like money and we look to things like money as an idol because we believe that if we just had money, it would meet all of our needs. It would fill all the gaps in our life. It would, it would take care of everything for us. And, and an idol is something that we place above God in our hearts. It's something that we worship, it's something that we look to other than God to do the things for us that only God can do. You see, we think things like money can provide happiness, can provide security, can provide long-term hope, but only God can do those things. Money is so temporary and fleeting. You know, we worship the gods of security and comfort. This past year, many of us were challenged in that. It's, it's why people ran out and bought toilet paper during COVID, because we worship this idea that, that we want to be safe, that we want to be comfortable, that we want to feel secure and, and know that everything is taken care of. And, and yet we look to those kinds of things, uh, things in our culture and things in our lives to make us feel secure when really only God can do that. Only God can bring the hope and safety and security, things that we need. Another idol that we worship in our culture is this idea of popularity and fame. We all think that if, if everyone knew our name, if we could just go viral, right? If we could just have one of those TikTok videos online that, that everyone could see, if, if we could do that and everyone knew us and we'd have money and we'd be set for life and if we could be a movie star or an athlete and, and all of those things, we think that that would bring us happiness and meaning in our lives and purpose in our lives. But, but it's not true. God is the only one who can bring purpose and meaning in our lives. God is the only one that can fulfill those desires in our hearts. Being famous or, or, or wealthy or, or having all the things that this world says we should have, all the idols that we tend to look to in our culture today are, are failing, they're falling apart. And if there's anything that this story should do, this story of the, the plagues that God brought in his power uh, against Egypt, it should remind us that there's only one God who is able to meet the deepest needs of our hearts and our lives. There's only one place that we can find true happiness, true significance, and true meaning in this life. And it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can't find those kinds of things in, in money or fame or, or the, the security that our world seems to seek so desperately. Let's turn from the idols of our culture and let's follow the one true God, the God who demonstrated through these works of power and might that He alone reigns sovereign and supreme in this world, that He alone is worthy of worship and honor and praise that He alone is the one that we should follow with our lives. And today I want to invite you, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you don't know this God personally and intimately, that's the other amazing part about God. He's not some unknowable God, a God of the sun or the, the, the God of the desert that can't be known, that's impersonable and, and unknowable. Our God loves us. He desires a personal relationship with us. He wants to know us intimately and personally, and He invites us into relationship with Him. It's very simple. We confess our sins. We trust in what Jesus did for us on the cross when He died and gave His blood so that we could become children of God. And when we believe in what God has done for us and put our faith and trust in Him, the Bible says we come into new life with Jesus Christ in a relationship with Him that begins today and lasts forever. And so I want to invite you, if you've never taken that step, to make that decision today. God's going to bless you and use you. You know, thank you so much again for being part of this series. I want to close us in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word and to see the miraculous works that you did on behalf of your people Israel when you brought these plagues against Egypt to demonstrate your power and authority, to show that you alone are the one true God. And we're reminded today, God, that there's so many other things that our hearts desire, so many idols that we often are tempted to seek after. And yet, God, we want to seek you and you alone. We want to lay down and confess it as a sin to, to pursue these other gods and these worth worthless idols that can never satisfy and never bring true happiness in our lives. And we want to trust you and, and walk with you. And God, it's my prayer today that if there's someone watching who's never trusted in Jesus for eternal life, 
never sought out that relationship with the one true God, that today would be the day they would cry out to you uh, and put their faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation and for eternal life. So God, thank you for loving us. Thank you that you're mighty to save. And thank you that you are the one true God that we can know and we can worship. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, thank you for watching this online presentation. If God has been speaking to your heart, we would love to connect with you and share with you more about how you can take your next steps in your relationship with God. In fact, right where you're watching, there's a link you can click to pray with someone or connect with the host who would love to share with you more about a personal relationship with Jesus. God bless you. Thank you again for watching. And remember, you are loved.